It's April 12th, 1967, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The chaos surrounding the production and release of the weirdly comedic and non-canon James Bond film Casino Royale was so intense that at its London premiere on this day in 1967, it was still being reworked and finished, with final edits actually being made in the projection room. Needless to say, it was not a critical success, with the US film critic Roger Ebert describing it as a definitive example of what can happen when everybody working on a film goes simultaneously berserk. <laughs> so wait, are you... Are you saying they were sitting up in the projection room at the premiere with like a razor blade? That is exactly what I'm saying. Out? Yeah, they were still oh trying God. to do it, <laughs> get it done. Spooling, it's spooling. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes sense when you watch it now. I mean, it, it, it have really we all does. seen the film now? Did we all watch it last night? I've yeah. seen clips. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't watch the whole thing. Okay. Well, I couldn't watch the whole thing either, but I tried. So I did rent yeah. it <laughs> for £3.49 and I managed to make it two hours of the way through, but I just couldn't handle the last 20 minutes. Likewise. It's too long already. Two hours is too long for for any comedy. I mean, there is literally no structure to it. You know, the classic stuff, you know, the hero's journey or whatever, that's out the window. It is just like a load of weird sketches chucked together that makes absolutely no sense. Mm-hmm. But that does make sense when you know the genesis of the film. So I think yes. to understand why Casino Royale is such a royale mess, we need to go back to 1961 when yeah. Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli, the producers of the James Bond movies, bought the James Bond novels from Ian Fleming, except for the very first one, which they couldn't because he'd already sold it for a thousand dollars, whoops, <laughs> to yeah. the actor Gregory Ratoff, who had subsequently died. So Ratoff had taken like this speculative bid on all oh, this Bond thing's interesting, then died, then his estate sold the rights to Casino Royale to another producer, Charles K. Feldman. Well, we also have to get into why Ratoff had it. And apparently he had been in Egypt acting in a film and ended up stealing £10,000 in cash from the Italian producers. And he was desperate to flee the country. And he prayed that if he made it to Athens safely, he would buy a copy of Time magazine and use the stolen money to purchase the rights to the first book he saw reviewed. And that was Casino Royale. Such a specific prayer. <laughs> Please help me, oh baby Jesus. Why would God be happy with this. <laughs> And so the reason that Ratoff never actually acted on the film rights, aside from the fact that he actually died a few years later, so he didn't have loads of time, was that, and this blew my mind, he was convinced that the James Bond stories were actually pretty stupid and bad. <laughs> and he thought the thing that was needed to make them work on screen was that Bond should be turned into a woman. This was He wow. wanted it to be Jane Bond, and he wanted her to be played by multi-Oscar-nominated actress Susan Hayward. I mean, that's really progressive and ahead of its time, right? I'm actually quite on board with Ratoff on that one. Did you see how he described her, though? <laughs> oh, no, OK, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> he apparently said, we'll get Susie Hayward. I f***ed her when she was a $75 a week actress, so she owes me one. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> well, it's a decision. Yeah. <laughs> so, subsequently, the Saltzman Broccoli Bonds came out and obviously hugely popular. Dr. No in 1962, From Russia With Love 1963, Sean Connery's an international star. Feldman thinks, aha, I've got a good deal here. This thing yeah. that I own, I should make this into a movie. Feldman was a, a successful Hollywood producer and had a relationship with Peter Sellers. And his first thought was, let's get Peter Sellers to play Bond, which is so ridiculous that even <laughs> Sellers had the self-awareness, despite his massive ego, to turn that down. So he then went to Saltzman and Broccoli and said, look, I've got the rights to this. Let's do this with Sean Connery. And they said, mm. no, we are not lending you Sean Connery. So <laughs> then he thought... Right, don't we pivot to making it a comedy because I could have Peter Sellers. He nearly said yes. And then he went about telling Peter Sellers that he had David Niven and told David Niven that he had Peter Sellers <laughs> and basically signed up as many sort of famous people as he could to this project by lying about some people. He's, he told Variety that he had Shirley MacLaine and he didn't. <laughs> and by the end of this sort of strange procedure of building up an ensemble cast for a comedy that was based on a book that was very much not a comedy but was a massive brand... He created this project that had to film in a few weeks' time because yeah. Peter Sellers only had a small slot in his diary 
and they had no workable script. <laughs> the eventual cast list included Ursula Andress, who had obviously been in the actual Bond film. She was in Doctor No. It also had loads of classic stars. It had Orson Welles, William Holden, Charles Boyer, and surely, I mean... Ronnie Corbett in what must surely be his oh. only credit alongside Orson Welles. <laughs> Actually, Corbett's great. I'd forgotten about Corbett was a shot in the arm when I really <laughs> yeah. needed it two hours in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in minor roles, you had people like John Le Mesurier and Bernard Cribbins, even Sterling Moss. Like, really, because it was filmed in London, you had these weird minor British celebrities popping up. Do you know what? I was reading about it and I was thinking, it's got a real Spice World vibe. Yes. Yeah. It ends up That's drawing exactly in more and more celebrities. It, it is yeah. Spice the fact World. that it's dog shit. It's a complete <laughs> mess, like Spice World. But like, but it's also just like Spice World was of the 90s. It is of the swinging 60s, isn't it? The other thing that was going wrong was that apparently Peter Sellers was a total nightmare to work with. And yeah. Ursula Andress said, Peter Sellers wants to change the whole script every day. And every day he got in a big fight with the producer, Charlie Feldman. Then Peter Sellers walked off and we had to wait. It was the craziest film I have ever made. And you just get this feeling that actually Sellers himself was part of the problem, not least of all because he was going through a tumultuous marriage breakdown with the future Bond girl, actually, Britt Eklund. So he was in a state of personal flux that I think contributed to his own volatile temperament. Yeah, and he had some kind of beef. It's unclear exactly what it was based on with Orson Welles. Ego. That's what it was based on. Mm. Didn't like to be on a set with someone more famous than him. Orson Welles was obviously also a huge diva, so you can see how the potential for catastrophe was there. <laughs> Apparently, though, the incident that actually sparked it was that Princess Margaret visited the set and Peter Sellers... <laughs> Was sort of <laughs> Peter Sellers was under the impression that he was kind of friends with Princess Margaret. Well, he invited her to the set. Is how it happened. Then she turned wow. up and went, Orson. Yeah, oh. I mean, you can only imagine. Like I am cringing internally for Peter Sellers. You can see how that would spark a white hot rage. But it ended with he wouldn't film his scenes with Orson Welles. They had to use stand-ins, but so that they weren't actually on screen together. Which is hard in a comedy, isn't it? If you can't get your two leads in the scene to be in the same shot as each other, it's quite hard to sync those shots up so that it's funny. <laughs> which I think is one of the problems. And apparently he kept rewriting the lines and resisting his lines, etc. because even though he'd turned down the opportunity to play a straight James Bond, he'd sort of become enamoured with the idea as well. So he wasn't really leaning into the comedy of it all. And he actually ended up leaving the production in kind of unclear circumstances. I'm not sure whether he jumped or whether he was pushed, but the production hadn't ended. It sort of reminds me a bit, actually, of Rowan Atkinson doing Johnny English. Like, clearly mm. Rowan Atkinson harbours a desire to be a straight lead, doesn't he? And he obviously mm. loves Bond and all the things that come with Bond, the women and the cars and everything. But he's Rowan Atkinson, so he's created this character where it's a comic Bond spoof. But actually, you can tell when you watch those movies, he doesn't want to be doing the Mr Bean type stuff in them. He wants yeah. to be Bond, but he, he knows he can't be. It's exactly the same with Sellers 40 years earlier, isn't it? Yeah, and meanwhile, the problem for Sellers is that he's stumbled into what it pretty much amounts to Austin Powers, you know, and actually was the inspiration for Austin Powers. But in the 60s, contemporaneously, I mean, you can't satirise the swinging 60s when you're a part of it. <laughs> no. One thing that's really odd as well is that some character names are in the film. Like, if you've seen the Daniel Craig Casino Royale, you've got, like, Vesper Lynn, for instance, mm. is a character in it, because it's... It's, it's actually really unusual for a parody to have the rights to the source material mm. rather than just having to sort of pastiche it. It results in a really strange end product. I mean, it's hard to sum it up, and I'm not even going to bother summing it up because it, it's so tonally different and it has a completely disjointed plot that's, you know, impossible and pointless to summarise. But the end scene in particular is this climactic Wild West shootout kind of <laughs> pastiche, and it's very Mel Brooks. It's basically the end of Blazing Saddles. I mean, the other wild thing about it is that it went on to be remade, obviously, but be remade as its most serious incarnation. Yes, with the same title. Yeah, the Casino Royale of the Daniel Craig era kind of kicks off the most serious bond we've ever seen. But the original one, you know, going back to this now, it's just, it's like this discordant brain frying thing to go, how is this even related to what Ian Fleming would have written and, and what we have now seen as the contemporary Casino Royale? Well, uh, do you want to hear something else that's really wild? The film was a gigantic success. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. 
Because it's tempting to think, oh, critical failure, complete mess. But actually, it broke records for the first three days of any release from Columbia Films. It made $40 million, which A, is more than the first two Bond films combined. (laughs) And it made more money, not adjusted for inflation. It made more actual cold, hard, same cash than last year's Best Picture Oscar winner, Nomadland, which made $39 million, not adjusted for inflation. That's incredible. It got nominated for an Oscar, which is the thing that made me spit my (laughs) cornflakes out this morning when I was looking at IMDb. But then I did click through and realised that it was the Oscar for Best Original Song for The Look of Love for Burt Bacharach, which is fair enough. Yeah, which is good. That is the best thing about it. That's also insane. It's like this psychedelic, disjointed parody of James Bond. (laughs) And the theme is The Look of Love. Like, what? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Tomorrow. The part where it started to get a little bit scary was when the pair of them went to Spain to visit her parents. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.